Although microbes such as bacteria, protozoans, viruses and viroids are found everywhere, they are quite at home inside your mother's kitchen. And why not? Since microbes help us prepare various useful household products such as curd, bread, idli dosa, dhokla, to name just a few. For example, have you ever wondered how milk, when left overnight with a little curd in a warm place, turns into curd by morning? The little curd added to the milk initially acts as an inoculum or starter that has useful bacteria called lactobacillus, also known as lactic acid bacteria or lab. Lab, which is present in millions inside the inoculum, multiplies at a suitable temperature and converts milk sugar lactose into lactic acid. The lactic acid in turn makes the milk thicker and partly digests the milk proteins resulting in the formation of curd. Lab improves the nutritional quality as the curd now has increased quantities of vitamin B12. After the curd is prepared, it is stored in a cool place so that the lab doesn't make it excessively sour by producing lactic acid. Another benefit of lab is to check the presence of harmful bacteria inside our stomach. In addition, some bacteria help in curing of tea, cheese and tobacco. Curing is the process that determines the flavor of tea, cheese and tobacco based on the degree of fermentation and putrefaction they have undergone by bacteria. Different varieties of cheese are distinguished by their characteristic texture, flavor and taste, all of which depend on the choice of microbe used. For example, Swiss cheese has large holes because bacteria Propionibacterium charmani produce a large amount of carbon dioxide. Roquefort cheese, on the other hand, acquires its characteristic flavor due to a specific fungus called Penicillium roqueforti that is used to ripen it. Microbes help in making of other traditional food like bread, idli dosa, dhokla, and khaman by a common process of fermentation. To make bread, baker's yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae is added to uncooked dough. The dough rises due to exhalation of carbon dioxide by the yeast. Now, when the bread is baked, the carbon dioxide escapes to leave a porous and light bread. Yeast helps in the preparation of idlis and dosas in a similar manner. A mixture of ground rice and dal is allowed to stand overnight and ferment. This mixture rises and sours due to the growth of yeast cells, which lends the sour flavor in the idli and dosa. In case of dhokla and khaman, the batter is prepared in a similar way with Bengal gram dal and left overnight to be fermented by microbes. Yeast also helps in wine and beer preparation by fermenting the sugars present in fruit juices or barley to produce alcohol and carbon dioxide. This is the same principle that is used in the production of toddy, a traditional drink in southern India made by fermenting the sap of the palm tree. Similarly, aerobic bacteria called acetobacter converts ethyl alcohol to produce acetic acid or vinegar. This explains why the word vinegar means sour wine. Microbes are also used to ferment fish, 
soya bean and bamboo shoots to prepare different foods. Therefore, several of our traditional food and drinks are derived from various microbes every day. Microbes have proved to be useful inside our kitchen by helping us prepare various food items such as bread, curd, dosa, wine, and toddy. Naturally, the same underlying principle of fermentation that is used to prepare these products is also applied on a large scale in various industries. In industries, microbes are grown in large vessels called fermenters that are used to make beverages like wine, beer, whiskey, brandy and rum on a large scale. One such microbe is Saccharomyces cerevisiae that is known as baker's yeast due to its use in bread making. It also acts as brewer's yeast by fermenting different malted cereals and fruit juices to produce ethanol. So, depending on the type of beverage used for fermentation, and the type of processing such as distillation, different alcoholic drinks are prepared. For example, wine and beer, which are low in alcoholic content, are prepared by fermentation of sugar or starch products from plants, and their production does not involve distillation. On the other hand, whiskey, brandy and rum, which are high in alcoholic content, are produced by distillation of fermented malted barley, grape juice and molasses respectively. Other than alcoholic beverages, microbes help in the industrial production of antibiotics, chemicals, enzymes, and other bioactive molecules. Antibiotics are chemicals produced by some microbes that can kill or check other harmful disease-causing microbes. In Greek, the word antibiotic means against life, that is, against the life of harmful disease-causing microbes. Penicillin is the first antibiotic that was discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928 by serendipity. While working on bacteria staphylococci, Alexander Fleming discovered that this bacterium did not grow around a particular mold called Penicillium notatum on unwashed culture plate. He realized that bacteria did not grow around the mold Penicillium notatum as it released a chemical. He called this chemical penicillin after the mold. Though Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, it was Ernest Chain and Howard Florey who applied the curative effect of penicillin against various infectious diseases. During World War II, penicillin was effectively used to treat several soldiers. For this contribution, both Chain and Florey were awarded the 1945 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine along with Sir Alexander Fleming. After penicillin, other new antibiotics such as streptomycin that was used to treat tuberculosis were discovered. Streptomycin along with other antibiotics like actinomycin, steptothricin, and neomycin were all produced by different species of bacterial genera, streptomyces. Since then, more antibiotics have been discovered that have greatly helped save lives around the world 
by curing various infectious diseases such as diphtheria, leprosy, plague, and whooping cough. Besides alcohol and antibiotics, microbes also produce chemicals such as organic acids. A fungus Aspergillus niger helps produce citric acid, which is very useful for the soft drinks industry. Similarly, microbes such as Acetobacter, Clostridium butylissum, and Lactobacillus or Lab produce acetic acid, butyric acid, and lactic acid respectively. Like acid, the production of enzymes by microbes has proved to be very useful for industries. For example, enzymes such as lipases are used in detergents for their ability to remove oily stains. Industrial lipase is produced from fungi such as Candida rugosa and Aspergillus niger. Likewise, pectinases and proteases produced by microbes such as Aspergillus niger are used in bottled fruit juices for clarification. This is why bottled fruit juices bought from the market are so much clearer than those prepared at home. Another enzyme, streptokinase, which is produced by bacteria, streptococcus, is genetically engineered to act as a clot buster. It is used to remove clots from blood vessels in patients suffering from myocardial infarction commonly known as a heart attack. Furthermore, statins produced by yeast, monascus purpureus, are used as blood cholesterol lowering agents. They work by competitively inhibiting the enzyme that produces cholesterol in the liver. Cyclosporin A is another useful microbial offering by fungus Trichoderma polysporum. It is administered as an immunosuppressant to organ transplant patients so that their immune system doesn't reject the transplant. Lastly, bacteria and fungi are also used in microbiological cultures where they are grown on nutritive solutions and allowed to colonize so that they can be studied. Therefore, microbes such as bacteria and fungi play an important role in the production of products such as alcoholic beverages, antibiotics, acids, enzymes and other chemicals on an industrial level. Every city or village produces millions of tons of wastewater, spent water from residences that carry body wastes, excreta, food remains and laundry wastes to name a few. Similarly, industries spew commercial wastes through wastewater. All such wastewater is called sewage. Have you ever wondered where all this sewage produced by us goes? It certainly cannot be just deposited as it is into rivers or the sea. Sewage is first treated by microbes that are naturally present inside it before it can be safely disposed of in rivers and streams to avoid polluting these water bodies. That is why the Ministry of Environment and Forests has produced the construction of a large number of sewage treatment plants under the Ganga Action Plan and Yamuna Action Plan to save major rivers like the Ganga and Yamuna. In India, microbes are already treating gallons of wastewater inside several sewage plants around the country every day. 
Let's take a look at how microbes help in sewage treatment. Microbial treatment of sewage usually takes place in two stages, primary and secondary treatment. In the primary stage, the objective is to remove coarse solids and other large and small particles found in sewage. The first step of primary treatment involves filtration, which is followed by grit removal inside a primary settling tank. All the floating debris is removed by sequential filtration, whereas the grit, such as coarse soil or pebbles, is removed via sedimentation. During sedimentation, most organic and inorganic solids settle while floating materials like grease and plastic rise to the surface and are skimmed off. The settled solids are called primary sludge, while the floating material comprises primary effluents. Primary effluents are now transferred from the primary settling tank to large aeration tanks for secondary treatment, also known as biological treatment. Secondary treatment aims to reduce organic matter in the effluents. In the aeration tanks, the effluents are constantly agitated mechanically and oxygen is pumped into them. As a result, aerobic bacteria naturally present in the effluents grow into flocks, which are mesh-like structures formed by groups of bacteria in association with fungal hyphae or filaments. In the presence of oxygen, these growing aerobic microbes consume the organic matter present in the effluents. This secondary treatment reduces the BOD or biochemical oxygen demand of water. BOD is an important measure of water quality. It refers to the amount of oxygen needed by bacteria and other microbes to oxidize all the organic matter in one liter of water. The BOD of drinking water should be less than 0.5. However, the BOD of raw sewage can be as high as 600 milligrams per liter. That is, the greater the BOD of wastewater, the more polluted it is. Also, it is an indicator of the amount of organic matter present in water. Secondary treatment is continued till BOD decreases considerably. Once this is accomplished, the effluents are transferred to another aeration tank where the flocks of bacteria are gradually allowed to sediment. This sedimented part of sewage is known as activated sludge, which is pumped into large tanks called anaerobic sludge digesters. Here, anaerobic bacteria digest the bacteria and fungi present in the activated sludge and produce a mixture of gases such as methane, hydrogen sulfide and carbon dioxide. This mixture of gases is also called biogas and is used as fuel since it is inflammable. Methane is the main gas produced from sewage treatment and also serves as fuel. It is used to produce heat in homes and factories. The sludge left after digestion of both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria is used as manure and is called activated sludge. The effluents that now remain from the secondary treatment plant are now fit to be released into natural water bodies like rivers and streams. However, a small part of the activated sludge is pumped back into the aeration tank to serve as inoculums for subsequent treatments. Though the amount of sewage produced increases every year with the population increase, and rapid urbanization, microbial treatment of sewage remains the most effective method to date. 
for thousands of years, since the time of ancient Egypt, yeast has been used for baking and fermentation. With time, it was observed that dough rose during the bread making process due to the exhalation of carbon dioxide by yeast. When bread is baked, the carbon dioxide escapes, leading a porous and light bread. Similarly, during fermentation, to prepare beverages and cheese, the main gas that yeasts produce is carbon dioxide. It is therefore evident that microbes produce gases during their growth and metabolism. Even so, different microbes produce different gases depending on the organic substrates they utilize. For example, anaerobic bacteria that grow on organic matter such as cellulose produce copious amounts of methane along with carbon dioxide and hydrogen gases. Due to this reason, these bacteria are collectively known as methanogens. Did you know that explorers have found methanogens even in extreme climates such as under the ice in Greenland and in the hot, dry desert of Utah in the United States? Cattle also have methanogenic bacteria called methanobacterium present inside the rumen. This helps them digest the cellulose present in the grass they feed on. This explains why cattle dung, also locally called gobar, is rich methanobacterium. This dung or gobar is used to generate biogas also known as gobar gas, in a biogas plant. In India, two types of biogas plants are used, the fixed dome type and the floating gas holder type. In the fixed dome type, the dome is made of concrete and is fixed, whereas in the floating gas holder type, the lid is made of stainless steel and is movable. The floating gas holder type of biogas plant is covered with a floating lid so that it can freely rise when microbial activity by methanogens produces gas inside the biogas plant. A biogas plant usually consists of a concrete tank that is 10 to 15 feet deep where slurry of dung and other bio wastes like plant and animal remains is placed. In fact, the bio wastes and cattle dung in the slurry are first soaked in water and mixed in the mixing tank before they are allowed into the main tank so that they provide the bacteria a suitable medium to grow. Methanobacterium and other anaerobic bacteria present in the slurry decompose it to release a mixture of methane carbon dioxide and hydrogen. This mixture of gases is also known as biogas. Moreover, the lid also collects the gas generated which is allowed to flow through the outlet pipe while the overflow tank collects the excess gas released. The biogas generated reaches nearby houses via an outlet pipe. where it is used for cooking and lighting. The remaining exhausted slurry can be used as fertilizer. Did you know that the technology of biogas production was developed in India by the Indian Agricultural Research Institute or IARI and the Khadi and Village Industries Commission or KVIC? India needs more such biogas plants to have an alternative energy source for LPG since biogas is a low-cost fuel that burns without emitting smoke. As cattle dung is available in abundance in rural areas, 
Many more biogas plants are being set up in our villages. However, even in cities like Pune, there are some commendable instances of lighting streetlights with biogas. Biogas can also be used to run electric engines such as pumps, as it causes less air pollution. Therefore, whether a village or city, establishing a biogas plant is an effective way to generate energy from wastes, and this has been made possible by microbial activity. Several years ago, the grass alfalfa was substantially reduced in the northeastern United States due to a killer pest called alfalfa weevil. Now, alfalfa was a very essential produce in the grasslands of the United States as it was grown as fodder for cattle and also helped increase agricultural efficiency as it was a leguminous plant. Realizing the importance of diminishing alfalfa and to combat the alfalfa weevil terror, natural enemies of the pest, such as a small wasp called Bathyplectus and lady beetles, were introduced. Sometimes, farmers went to the extent of importing such beneficial insects from far-off countries like China to check the weevil pestilence. This use of biological methods to control plant diseases and pests is called biological pest control. Whereas the beneficial organisms nurtured to deal with pests are known as biocontrol agents. This biocontrol method, which relies on natural predation, is in stark contrast to the modern day practice of dealing with insects and pests with toxic chemicals such as pesticides and insecticides. Not only are these chemicals harmful to human beings, animals and the environment since they pollute soil and groundwater with their toxicity, but they are also expensive for farmers, especially in developing countries like India. Recently, after a spate of suicides by Indian farmers in the Vidarbha region of Maharashtra due to failed crops and debts, scientists suggested organic farming as a means of smart agriculture that would also save them from spending money on chemicals like insecticides, pesticides and weedicides. The principle of organic farming lies in biodiversity. The greater the variety of flora and fauna in the fields, the more sustainable is farming. Therefore, in organic farming, insects and pests are not always completely eradicated. Rather, they are kept at manageable levels within the living ecosystem. At times, Eradication of pests is actually undesirable because several beneficial predatory and parasitic insects depend on them as food or hosts for their survival. Organic farming, in other words, is an attempt to create a living, vibrant and natural ecosystem in the fields by using natural green manure, compost, organic insecticides, fertilizers and biological pest control methods and limiting the use of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. Organic farming therefore requires an understanding of various interactions that take place between different flora and fauna that live in the fields. Also, it is important to possess detailed knowledge of the different life forms that live in the fields, their life cycles, feeding patterns and preferable habitats. Such knowledge of life around the field helps implement 
biocontrol of pests. For instance, insects such as the lady beetle, also known as the lady bird, can be used to eliminate aphids. Whereas dragonflies can stamp out mosquitoes. Keeping facts like this in mind, beneficial insects that serve as biocontrol agents are conserved under an Integrated Pest Management or IPM program. IPM is an integrated approach to crop management to solve ecological problems relating to agriculture. It provides an efficient solution to organic farming since it involves biological controls. For example, you may have heard of Bt cotton and Bt brinjal in the news. Did you know that Bt stands for the bacteria Bacillus thuringiensis? Bt is a microbial biocontrol agent that is introduced into fields to control butterfly caterpillars. Bt is available as dried spores which are mixed with water and sprayed on plants such as brassicas that are under attack from insect larvae. When insect larvae consume the spores or crystals of this bacteria, the alkaline pH of their gut activates the cryotoxin present in the bacterial spores which ultimately kills the larvae. These toxins in Bt are insect specific and therefore do not harm other organisms. The biocontrol agent Bt is also used to develop genetically modified Bt crops such as Bt cotton and Bt brinjal by introducing Bt genes into cotton and brinjal plants respectively with the help of genetic engineering. These crops then become resistant to attack by insect pests. Another natural insecticide called pyrethrum, extracted from the flower head of Chrysanthemum cinerarii folium, is used in organic farming practices. Moreover, due to the insecticidal properties of the plant, it is also sometimes grown near crops to repel insects such as aphids and leafhoppers. Likewise, a free living fungus called trichoderma, which is very common in plant roots, acts as a biocontrol agent for various plant pathogens. In addition, baculoviruses of genus Nucleopolyhedrovirus are used as biocontrol agents for insects and other arthropods. These viruses have an additional advantage as they are species specific. They do not harm other plants, mammals or other non-target insects. Such biocontrol agents are especially desirable in IPM programs or when an ecologically sensitive area is being treated. In this manner, biocontrol agents play a dual role by helping in organic farming and maintaining a balance in the ecosystem. In the 1800s, a German chemist, Justus von Liebig, had proposed the use of chemical elements like nitrogen that are beneficial to plant growth in soil so that abundant food can be produced around the world. Thus, chemical fertilizers were born. However, Liebig's noble dream to eliminate hunger around the world by increased productivity could not be realized. Around the early 20th century, a British scientist, Sir Albert Howard, objected to the addition of chemicals to agricultural soil. 
He insisted that it was the health of the soil that determined the growth of plants. However, in his lifetime, he was ridiculed for his beliefs. But later, farmers and scientists around the world realized that chemical fertilizers were the chief pollutants of both the environment and soil. The impact of these fertilizers had become so severe that in Punjab, about 10% of groundwater samples show the presence of noxious chemicals more than the permissible limit prescribed by the World Health Organization or WHO. This paved the need for organic farming wherein biofertilizers are used instead of synthetic chemical fertilizers. Did you know that it was Sir Howard's writings that formed the basis of organic farming? Which is why he is also regarded as the father of organic farming. Biofertilizers are substances containing living organisms such as bacteria, cyanobacteria and fungi that promote plant growth naturally by increasing soil fertility. Moreover, they sometimes form symbiotic associations with plants and aid in inorganic nutrient uptake by the plants. Rhizobium, Azospirulum and Azotobacter are the most commonly used nitrogen-fixing bacteria in biofertilizers. Rhizobium bacteria exist symbiotically in the root nodules of leguminous plants where it converts atmospheric nitrogen into usable organic forms for plant use in return for food prepared by plants via photosynthesis. So, it is usually used as an inoculant for legume crops. Azospirulum and Azotobacter, on the other hand, are free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria that live in soil and convert atmospheric nitrogen into easily absorbable forms such as ammonia. They are usually used for crops such as millets, sugarcane, wheat and maize. Cyanobacteria such as Anabina, Nostoc and Oscillatoria are also used as biofertilizers since they are capable of fixing atmospheric nitrogen in special cells called heterocysts. Similarly, a water fern, Azola, forms a symbiotic association with cyanobacteria Anabina which helps the plant fix atmospheric nitrogen. Hence, Azola is extensively used as a biofertilizer in paddy fields. Also known as blue-green algae, cyanobacteria are photosynthetic, prokaryotic organisms that serve as important biofertilizers worldwide since they add organic matter to soil, thereby increasing its fertility. Even fungi, specifically those belonging to genus Glomus, form symbiotic associations like mycorrhiza with the roots of vascular plants. Fungi help the plant absorb phosphorus from the soil. In addition, these plants also show resistance to root-borne pathogens, metallic contamination, salinity and drought. In return, fungi receive carbohydrates such as glucose from the plants.
Moreover, as biofertilizers contain living organisms, they safely convert the complex unavailable nutrients, including remnant chemical fertilizers, if any, into simple absorbable forms, thereby making our environment eco-friendly. As a result, more and more farmers in our country are beginning to rely on these biofertilizers instead of chemical fertilizers because of their obvious utility and cost-effectiveness.